Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Marianne Johnson, who is going to be the moderator for this panel. She's just been a tremendous resource and help to myself in particular, and Francesca and Michelle, as we tried to put together this panel. Um, she really is a, a fountain of information about uh, women in Chicago, and uh, we really appreciate all she's done. Marianne Johnson is the president of the Chicago Area's Area Women's History Council, a nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that supports the research, writing, publication, and sharing of women's history. And they are currently working on, she's directing a major project entitled Documenting Women's Activism and Leadership in the Chicago Area 1945 to 2000. Um, and so I, I see this panel today as a, a little small piece of that. She's the former director of the Jane Addams Hull House Museum at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she oversaw the administration of the museum and the development of its educational and interpretive programs. During her last two years at UIC, she was assistant to the university librarian, working in the Department of Special Collections and Manuscripts in the Richard J. Daly Library on Hull House related collections. She's also had a hand in some very important books. She helped to develop and was associate editor of Women Building Chicago, 1790 to 1990, a biographical dictionary, which is a resource that so many of us turn to. She's also the editor of Many Faces of Hull House, of the photographs of Wallace Kirkland, and a co-author of Walking with Women Through Chicago History, Four Self-Guided Tours. Thank you, Joan. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and this is a really exciting event. And uh, I'm happy to finally get to the uh, point where the activists can talk because uh, people have been pulling on my sleeve all morning and saying that's not the way it was you know we were there and so on so we're gonna really hear it now from the people who lived through it and uh, maybe have a counter story to the uh, the uh, interpretation that uh, Betty Friedan uh, not only developed in her book, but then uh, developed uh, through her leadership in NOW, because here in Chicago, the uh, uh, Chicago branch of NOW was a very, very important part of the whole history of the National or Organization for Women. And uh, Ann Ladke was a member of that, and I know a lot of other people here in the audience, Marianne Lupa and so on, were also a part of that, so we want to hear from you. So let me uh, begin by introducing each of our panelists. And the first person is Rebecca Sive, who many of you know. Uh, Rebecca writes and speaks on women, politics, and power, and advancing one's professional opportunities through public leadership. She's the principal of the Sive Group, a public affairs consulting practice committed to developing programs that advance women's power, autonomy, reproductive health, and economic security. And she teaches women in public leadership at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy Studies. She's a founding member of the Illinois Human Rights Commission. She began her professional career at the American Jewish Committee, co-founded one of the nation's first women's center, the Midwest Women's Center, led many organizations, has been an advisor to numerous women leaders, and is among organizers of, uh, organizers of women's issues agendas for Presidents Carter, Clinton, and Obama. Uh, Rebecca currently writes for the Huffington Post. She's won numerous awards, including Distinguished Achievement Awards from her undergraduate alma mater, Carleton College, and the University of Illinois at Chicago, where re she received an MA in American History. Most recently, Rebecca is the author of Every Day is Election Day, A Women's Guide to Winning Any Office from the PTA to the White House, a no-nonsense guide for women who want to be influential and uh, powerful public leaders, which was published in August of this year by Chicago Review Press. And of course, we have copies over here. So uh, when this panel is over, please go over and get your copy and get Rebecca to sign it. Okay. 
So uh, our, our next panelist is Christine Riddio. And uh, Christine Riddio has been an activist in the women's and LGBT movements since 1970. She was a leader of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, co-chair of the Gay and Lesbian Coalition of Metropolitan Chicago, and co-chair of the Illinois Gay and Lesbian Task Force. She moved to Washington, D.C. in 1983 to work for the National Organization for Women. She helped organize the first conference of openly gay and lesbian elected officials in 1985 and was president of the Gertrude Stein Gay Democratic Club. She's on the board of the Americans for Democratic Action Education Fund and is a vice chair of the Democratic Socialists of America. Currently, Chris is a principal technical training consultant with the Statistical Analysis Systems Institute. She has a bachelor's degree in astronomy from Carleton College. So we've got two Carltonites sitting right here and a, a master's degree and PhD candidacy in astronomy from Northwestern University. And uh, I had, a, had the pleasure of interviewing Chris for our project. And I, I also, I've interviewed Rebecca uh, as well. And uh, one of the things that Chris told me was that when she graduated from high school, she wanted to be an astrophysicist. And uh, so I thought that was a a pretty amazing am ambition. Okay, our next person is Ann Ladke. And uh, Ann Ladke, who many of you know, of course, is a nationally recognized expert on equal opportunity issues, workplace fairness, workforce development, and higher education policy, and issues affecting low-paid working women. She's a founding member of Women Employed a 40-year-old Chicago organization, to this year they're just celebrating their 40th anniversary, whose mission is to improve women's economic status and remove barriers to economic inequality. She joined the staff at Women Employed in 1977 and was named executive director in 1985. While there, Anne has developed and directed innovative advocacy and training programs designed to improve women's economic status. She's the author of numerous reports, articles, and testimony on women's economic issues. Under Anne's leadership, Women Employed has won numerous awards for program and management excellence, including the US Department of Labor's Exemplary Public Interest Contribution Award. Uh, and she didn't really begin, well, she began her career certainly working on uh, uh, women's economic issues, but she served on many public boards and commissions during her career. But before joining the staff of Women Employed, Anne was an active volunteer in Chicago women's organizations, serving as a founding board member of Chicago Women in Publishing, which is an important organization that goes on today, and as president of the National Organization for Women's Chicago chapter from 1973 to 1975. And um, our last panelist is Joan Hall. And Joan Hall is a retired partner in the law firm of Jenner and Block. She joined the firm following her graduation from Yale Law School in 1965. She's the co-founder of the Young Women's Leadership Charter School, the only all-girls public school in Chicago. The Young Women's Leadership Charter School opened in August 2000 as part of an effort to provide better educational opportunities for disadvantaged young women on Chicago's South Side. The school focuses on teaching math, science, and technology, enrolls up to 350 girls, 7 through 12, and prepares its students to graduate from high school and continue through a post-secondary education. In 2002, Joan received the Women's Bar Association of Illinois Women with Vision Award which, award, which honors women who have demonstrated visionary approaches in their careers and have contributed to the empowerment of women in law. Last week, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Lawyer at a ceremony in New York City. So this is our distinguished panel. So let's welcome them.
Okay, well, I have uh, just a couple of questions to kind of get things started, but um, I'm really hoping that you will take this opportunity to comment on almost anything that you uh, want to that relates to your activism, particularly here in Chicago, and its relationship to some of the provo provocative ideas and themes that we've uh, discussed earlier this morning. So my first question, just to get us going, is, and we'll take it one by one, starting with Rebecca and then going on down. How and when did you first become aware of the feminine mystique? Describe the context in which you learned about it. How did it strike you at the time? How did it influence you? If the book had little influence on you, please say why you think this was and perhaps identify a book that did influence you instead. Because I know that not everybody was influenced by the feminist state. Okay, Rebecca, shall we start with you? Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks to the Newberry and to uh, Michelle and all the other leaders of this spectacular symposium. It's really a treat to be here. And thanks to Marianne, who was um, my second boss in Chicago. I was her file clerk at Jane Addams Hall no, House. You were tour guide. Tour guide, file clerk, <laughs> what do you call it, uh, when I was studying uh, American history. Um, and on that point, I was interested in women's history. That's why I was there. And to answer uh, Marianne's question, um, I don't actually remember when I first heard about the book, although I believe it was while I was at Carleton. Um, my uh, uh, major advisor was Paul Wellstone, and so we had a lot of uh, terrific opportunity to learn about social and political movements. Um, I don't recall, I've been reflecting on this, uh, um, my mother who raised five children and had a very um, successful career, but um, did have the primary childcare responsibility. I don't remember her reading the book. Uh, I don't remember seeing it in our house. Uh, there were a lot of other books about politics, but not that one. Um, so the book that really uh, impelled me to activism to answer uh, Marianne's question was Sisterhood is Powerful, the collection of essays, I believe published in 1970, uh, by, uh, edited by Robin Morgan. And uh, I was handed that book uh, actually while I was in Chicago on an, on an urban studies program for uh, political activists who were interested in urban policy, and uh, that just blew me away. And so I then went back and started reading uh, a lot of different pieces of literature, uh, and I would just, um, so that, that's really how uh, I came to the feminine mystique in this broader context of trying to understand political activism uh, by women and becoming an activist myself. I did have the opportunity to work with Ferdan later, so perhaps when we get to that um, point of time, I'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, Chris. Well, I first read The Feminine Mystique when it was published in 1963. Here, here. That one works? Okay. okay. I first read The Feminine Mystique when it was published in 1963. My best friend had given me a copy for my 17th birthday, and it was my first real introduction to the idea of women's rights and women's liberation. And I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, I grew up in Wauwatosa, about 90 miles north of here, suburb of Milwaukee, in the 50s. And it was middle America, suburban, white, very white, middle class. Uh, in the early 50s, I found the two things that uh, were the great interests of my life, politics and science. And in 52, we got a TV, and I remember watching the political conventions, and I thought, this is terrific. This is very exciting. Uh, and then I uh, got involved or interested in astronomy, and I started reading what I could about that and decided I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to go into space, all of those kind of things. But the reality in that time was that the opportunities for girls were extremely limited. Uh, I remember in the late 50s, as people were talking about going to college, uh, a number of the girls were saying, oh, I want to go and get my MRS degree. 
And I was fairly clueless, and I thought, well, I've heard of a BA and a PhD, but <laughs> what's an MRS? And then I figured it out. And I looked around, and I, what I saw among the adult women in Wauwatosa was that they were either wives and mothers, or they were old maid school teachers. And I decided then that I was going to be, if those were my choices, I was going to be an old maid school teacher. <laughs> that was it. Uh, and when I read The Feminine Mystique a few years later, uh, it basically said to me that there could be other choices for women. We weren't quite there yet. And in fact, in 64, I started at Carleton. I'm not sure quite why Carleton is so prominent on this panel, but it's a good school. Uh, it, and I, when I got up there, there was no organized women's movement. Uh, in fact, my first year at Carleton, uh, the female students had to wear dresses to dinner. Uh, if you were going to be out of the dorms after 7 o'clock, uh, you had to sign out. Um, this summer, one of my instructors died, and it prompted me to get out my yearbooks. And being a numbers person, I counted up how many women were on the faculty. And out of a faculty of about 100, 11 were women. Five of them were in the women's physical education department. <laughs> so if I hadn't taken PE, and we had to take three years when I was there, uh, I would never have had a woman instructor in college. So, you know, things did start to change. The rule about having to wear dresses went by the by while I was at Carleton. Uh, and uh, the student movement started up. Now, my first actual involvement in activism was around the time I started college, George Wallace carried Wauwatosa in the Wisconsin primary. And so I wrote a letter to the editor and uh, got that published. And I wrote another one a little later on cross-burning, which also happened in Wauwatosa. And the upshot of that was that my mother got uh, a number of phone calls saying, can't you control your daughter, basically? <laughs> and some of them saying, you know, if you don't stop this, we'll burn a cross on your lawn, uh, kind of thing. Uh, it didn't help having a last name like Ridio. Uh, where there was only one in the Milwaukee phone book. You know. um, and while I was at college, I began to get involved in the student anti-war movement. Uh, I started uh, sort of neglecting my classes, going to teach-ins in the Twin Cities, sit-ins on campus to stop military recruitment. We had a march on Northfield, Minnesota to stop the war. <laughs> yes, I know, it seems a little goofy today, but... Um, the other thing that happened while I was in college was I realized I was gay. And while I might have chanted along with the other student protesters, girls say yes to boys who say no, I had no more interest in saying yes than I did when I was 12 and I decided I would be a school teacher, an old maid school teacher. Now, all of these things, you know, the, the letters to the editor, the student protests, along with the feminine mystique, shaped my worldview and made me realize that the struggles against racism, sexism, the protests against the war in Vietnam were interconnected. But I also knew from my experience with the anti-war movement that the men of the left were mostly not interested in women's liberation or anything else. They liked the chance more than anything. Uh, and I moved to Chicago in 68, and from there uh, became involved in the women's movement. And uh, I joined the Chicago Women's Liberation Union and spent the next several decades through CWLU and later now and various LGBT organizations fighting for women's liberation and gay and lesbian liberation. And while it was the first reading of the feminine mystique that really put me on that path to activism and feminism, it was really in the women's union and the organizations that were actually doing something about it that I understood, I began to understand the importance of activism and organizing and strategy. Anne? Um, <clears throat> this one's working now. Actually, Wauwatosa is just as well represented up here as Carleton College is. <laughs> because I was born in Wauwatosa, really? honestly. <laughs> I never didn't know you were. And I, I have to say, I'm very chagrined. I didn't know until just now that anybody burned crosses in Wauwatosa. I left there when I was six, so maybe I missed it. Yeah, it must have been after that. Um, but anyway, those are my good Republican 
conservative Republican roots, and actually the first political work I ever did, this was after I left Wauwatosa, moved to a um, different part of Milwaukee, um, was the requirement in my family um, that we had to do door-to-door -door work for Barry Goldwater. So <laughs> I'm probably the only person in this room who actually did political work for Barry Goldwater, but <laughs> it was either that or endure endless uh, trouble with my father, so I did it. Um, later, I just said, I'm so scared of dogs, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and, and, and it did work. Anyway, um, I, I can't really remember either how I learned about the feminine mystique, to tell you the truth, because um, uh, I really, I was an English major in college. I went to Northwestern. I never had a female professor or instructor, even though I was a humanities major. So I graduated in 1970, and there just weren't women faculty, period. And so I don't know where I would have talked about it or heard about it. Um, in, at the time. Um, and plus, I think the anti-war movement, it, it was always, every social movement was very late to get to Northwestern. Um, so, you know, they'd already had the entire women's movement at the University of Chicago before we even knew about it, you know, in Evanston. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it just, it was the anti-war movement, you know, kind of came there in, in the, the mid-60s. And um, so, that was really sort of the overriding political conversation, political movement. Um, like Rebecca, in terms of books that influenced me, the first book that I really delved into that, that had to do with women's rights was Sisterhood is Powerful. Um, and I found it, it blew me away too. Um, it was such an eye opener um, about the breadth of the issues, uh, the tremendously varied perspectives on the issues um, across racial groups, class, um, the breadth of the issues that the women's movement touched. Um, this was really a time, when I read Sisterhood is Powerful, I think so much of the conversation in the women's movement was really about what would it mean for this particular area of human endeavor if women mattered, right? We talked about that in the context of religion, the media, uh, politics, the economy, and so on. So all of that, you know, there was all kinds of inquiry and conversation going on. Um, I was, um, so that was really um, a, a big eye-opener for me. Um, we debated a lot about the kinds of things that were written in Sisterhood is Powerful. This was in a, a very, um, by happenstance, I, I went to work in the publishing industry when I, I got, I moved to Chicago, got into the publishing industry, and I had to get a ride out to Scott Forsman, which is in Glenview and my carpool happened to be full of feminists who were reading and arguing about Sisterhood is Powerful, so I had to read it to keep up. Um, and, and it really was an eye-opener. It was also there at Scott Forsman that um, we started organizing women. Um, women at Scott Forsman was probably one of the first three, four, five um, in-company caucuses that women were organizing in the early 70s to try to raise issues in their workplaces about in our case, we started with the way that women and girls were represented in the textbooks. Um, and the very sexist teacher's manuals and content in um, textbooks. So, the, you know, it was really very evident how women and girls got the ideas they got, because really it started quite young. Everything from how a teacher was instructed to teach motor skills to small children by giving boys, you know, hammers and blocks and by giving girls scissors and doll you know, cutting out uh, doll clothes. So all of that was very present in those textbooks in the early 70s, and that was part of what we first started organizing around. And then it moved on to issues like maternity leave. At that time, you could not even use your vacation for maternity leave. Um, that was prohibited. You just had to take time off without pay. Um, and while I was working at Scott Forsman, one of the women in my carpool became the first woman ever in the history of the company to work up until the day of her delivery. That was just unheard of. She just refused to be pushed out, um, and she stayed. Uh, so um, out of women at Scott Forsman also came this citywide group called Chicago Women in Publishing that we started, I think, in 71 or 72. Marianne Lupa and Wilma Stevens are here, and I think that's about right. Um, and. Uh, uh, then, through that same carpool, I got connected to Chicago Now, and through a variety of uh, circumstances I won't uh, explain, I became very active there and, and became the president um, at a time when we were really trying to build Chicago Now into a 
um, very practical, rigorous fighter for economic rights for women. So that was really what drove me then. Um, and so I think I probably came to the feminine mystique when, you know, around the time I came upon Betty Friedan and met her and realized what an incredibly powerful person she was, an incredibly powerful vision she, she had, and then I wanted to read more about it. I would honestly say that probably the document of hers that was most influential for me was the Statement of Purpose of Now, which, you know, has its, arc, you know, some um, archaic, aspects to it, but in many ways is as powerful a document today, I think, as it was then. Um, so, um, and, and Women Employed then, when, when the founder of Women Employed was trying to start this organization that would focus just on employment and, and uh, economic status, she came to Chicago now, and to those of us who were organizing in places like the publishing industry, there was a women's group at the library, there were other sort of small groups of women who were organizing in these different industries and called on us to help her start Women Employed. So that's, you know, sort of the web. And then I think I, I backed up um, into the feminine mystique. John? Thank you very much for being here. The Feminine Mystique was published in 1963. In 1963, I was a first year student at the Yale Law School. The only materials that crossed my desk <laughs> were textbooks, law reviews, and case studies. I was never influenced by women's magazines because I didn't read women's magazines. Uh, and I certainly, uh, and I never read the book until I was asked to join this panel. <laughs> There's honesty. There were seven women in my class of 160. Uh, when we were in our third year and started looking for permanent employment, there were a number of law firms that called the law school placement office and told them not to sign up any women for interviews because they didn't uh, hire women. We didn't picket or protest. Uh, we just kept going. I recently found uh, an article in a Time magazine uh, from March of 1964 with a quote that I would like to share with you, and it goes as follows. To most men, women are physically unfitted for the grueling ordeals of trial work and emotionally too kind and forgiving. <laughs> Fortunately, I also wasn't reading Time Magazine when I was in law school. <laughs> so I became a trial lawyer. So uh, when I graduated from law school in 1965, only 4% of the law school graduates in the entire country that year were women. Uh, I had some difficulty finding a job, but I'm very pleased to report that the Chicago law firm of Jenner and Block uh, offered me a job which I snapped up immediately. And for 35 years, I was the most senior woman at the law firm. Senior women can be la uh, loosely translated into oldest. Um, and uh, my awareness of women's issues really grew very slowly, very slowly. I would say that for the first 10 years of my practice, I never saw another woman uh, any time I went to court, any time I went to a conference, there were just very few women uh, in the large law firms in uh, Chicago. In 1974, I became chairman of the hiring committee at General Block, and I began to hire 50% women. Um, and so we, uh, we, we gradually began to uh, get some uh, better numbers. Uh, in 1979, I received a call inviting me to join the Chicago Network, uh, which was just being formed at that time, and it was a women's organization. It was quite a radical idea for me. I'd never thought about being part of a women's organization, and I wasn't too sure, uh, but I signed up. And the first meeting, uh, the first dinner meeting I went to, uh, every woman in the room stood up and described her work, and I was totally blown away. I had no idea that there were women uh, working in these very important jobs in very indust various industries in Chicago, uh, and it was really uh, very exciting to me. Uh, so it was not a big group, but it was a very strong group. Uh, so I came to feminism uh, very slowly. Okay. Um, well, I don't know uh, 
how relevant this next question is going to be, considering your former answers, but I'll ask it anyway. And that is, how relevant have the ideas in the feminine mystique been to your activism? Has this changed over time? Friedan's book has been criticized for its narrowness of focus and for the populations and issues that it left out. How relevant has this criticism been to your experience as an activist in Chicago? I actually think it's a great question, Marianne. I'll tell you why. I, um, perhaps along with Chris, come from the most left-wing uh, of portion of the women's movement. And um, I think that, uh, as Anne and I were describing, uh, a lot of that uh, orientation and philosophy about what we thought we needed to do came from reading. Uh, and uh, these manifestos, there were some uh, mention of Shulamith Firestone this morning. Um, that was a hugely important book for us. And so I think that from my own, um, as I reflect back, I, I think that I, I did spend uh, being a sort of nerdy, wonky type in a way. I spent a lot of time reading and thinking about these issues. And so though I too didn't look at the feminine mystique at that time, I think I did uh, really uh, consider quite carefully uh, what um, the issues that Friedan addressed and certainly saw uh, uh, problems that had no name uh, in my own uh, organizing. So I think that um, it, it's a good thing when um, a variety of perspectives are shared. At the same time, what I want to say is that I think that uh, perhaps where the book missed the boat, and I will tell you from my own experience with Friedan, where I think she may have been uh, somewhat <coughs> disingenuous, uh, she of course knew that um, there were millions of m American women who didn't live uh, the life of middle class housewives. And uh, she knew how much those women struggled. Uh, she knew how many of them uh, worked, as was mentioned this morning, for women like herself and the kind of lives they led. So I think um, what I'm troubled by is her, uh, I guess I'm troubled by her decision not to take that into account. On the other hand, uh, now having been an author, I understand you have to focus uh, and talk about what you know. So that makes sense to me. But I do think that to the extent that uh, criticism continues of uh, the women's movement as having been driven uh, and only led by white middle class women, uh, that some of that responsibility falls on Friedan's shoulders. Um, and I would say, related to that, I, uh, in the early 1980s, I believe it was, maybe later, uh, there was something called the National Mobilization for Women's Lives which uh, was around the issue of abortion. And the concern at the time was that we were losing ground. We were, we still are. And we would do this national mobilization. It was actually, this is an important piece of women's history. Uh, it was actually led and organized by Heather Booth uh, from Chicago. And Heather asked a number of us to join her. Um, I was asked to organize the activity in Chicago. And it was decided by Heather, I guess she felt that I could deal with um, strong and differing personalities, that she would send Betty Friedan and Raquel Welch to Chicago. <laughs> uh, so I and my staff uh, worked with the two of them uh, together. And um, here's the thing. So I found both of them equally committed uh, to the notion of women's uh, reproductive rights. Uh, equally uh, hardworking, uh, we asked them to do a lot. Uh, we also asked them to be very frank, they both were. But here, uh, and Raquel Welch was of course this you know, gorgeous actress known for her uh, beauty, not her brains. And here was Betty Friedan. So my experience with Betty Friedan went as follows. She was enormously difficult to work with. She was unpleasant. She was a prima donna. Uh, for better or for worse, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of um, 
important, famous women. Uh, and she wasn't one of my favorites. And uh, what I felt was that, why did this have to be so hard? Here we were, this range of people right in front of us, you and Raquel Welch and all these other women in Chicago. And this sort of denouement came when uh, she and I were sitting in her room. Mind you, we weren't asking her to sleep on, in a church basement somewhere. Uh, she was uh, very comfortably ensconced at the Drake Hotel. And she and I were sitting in her room and she sort of banged the proverbial shoe on the table and demanded uh, that I find her the best hairdresser in Chicago in the next 15 minutes. And that's no exaggeration. And I was, uh, I guess that's why Heather asked me to do this. I knew who to call. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I walked her down the street to Charles Ifrigan about 10 minutes later. Um, and I, I, I tell you this because I, I, I want you, to, I felt at the time that uh, I understood, I'm as into clothes and jewelry and hair and all of that as any woman. Uh, so I, it wasn't that I thought that that was unimportant. Uh, it is important and it's a joy and that's fine. Uh, but I didn't like the way I was treated uh, and I didn't like her insistence on this sort of queen bee notion. And, and I just tell you this story to say that I think that um, for some reason, it seemed to me, as I reflected on it later, that she wasn't able to, and I think <coughs> Anne had some of the same experience, she wasn't able to sort of um, sink in with the rest of us and experience the moment and the joy in a, in a, in, in a sort of sisterhood. She struck me as profoundly unhappy. And several years later, we invited her back to another meeting and I had the same experience with her. And I, I guess I felt, I understand that people who lead movements and work hard uh, and whose husbands desert them can be profoundly lonely, and I believe she was. But I felt sad that she couldn't then, at least from my experience with her, find this joy that I think a lot of us have found. Um, I mean, I've known, if I add up all the years, I've known my sister panelists it's way over 100 years. Uh, so I, I, I tell you that to say that I think that it would have been a wonderful had for Dan, being the genius she was, found a way perhaps to incorporate more into what she shared with us. That said, I think what she did was, of course, very important. Uh, well, I'm gonna take a quite different direction from what Rebecca has said. Um, in terms of the narrow focus of the feminine mystique. Uh, my feminist activism was completely interwoven with my involvement in gay and lesbian liberation. And in this regard, the feminine mystique is at best problematic. Uh, let's say. Uh, I actually have three different copies of the feminine mystique and uh, one of them is uh, the 20th anniversary edition uh, and it has what I think is actually the epilogue to the 10th anniversary edition. And in there, Fredan says, uh, she talks about how some of those trying to disrupt now, quote, seem to be using the women's movement to proselytize lesbianism. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, we get Jehovah's Witnesses coming to our door to proselytize, but we've never had a lesbian come to proselytize. <laughs> <laughs> It does, however, I mean, it fits in with Fredan's other comments of the time, the lavender menace and so on. And I decided for this panel, I'd go back and take a look and see what Fredan says about lesbianism and homosexuality. And there are comments in there, mostly in chapter 11, the <coughs> sex seekers, where she's talking about uh, sexual adventures among married women and how uh, she says, uh, even when she asked questions that uh, uh, were not oriented towards uh, sexual activity, they would give uh, answers that were explicitly sexual. And that she interpreted this as a sort of a, the emptiness of their relationships. Um, 
And in this chapter, she does spend some time talking about homosexuality. Now, almost all of it is male homosexuality, um, and I could say a few things about that, but I'll try and contain myself here a little. Uh, she writes, for example, homosexuality is spreading like a murky smog over the American <laughs> scene. And she goes on to say, the shallow unreality, immaturity, promiscuity, lack of lasting human satisfaction that characterize the homosexual sex life usually characterize all his life and interests. And as I read this, my first reaction was, oh my god, I can't believe she's saying this. But, you know, this is 50 years later. And so I think in order to try and understand what she's saying or to try and put it into context, we have to think about what the view was 50 years ago. Um, now, historically, uh, what Fredan wrote is not all that different from what most, most of what was written and thought about homosexuals at that time. They were almost all men. After all, what could two women do? They were a threat to children. Their lifestyle was depraved, sick, and sinful. Now, one of the books I found in my basement as I was doing this is this, The Lesbian in America, 1964. And in the introduction to this, uh, uh, what is described as the best book on lesbianism that I have ever read, Albert Ellis, a leading psychologist, says, an objective study of full-fledged lesbians, as well as of fixed male homosexuals, would show that many or most of them are not merely neurotic, but are actually borderline or outright psychotics. I mean, that's what people thought 50 years ago. Um, there's uh, discussion about momism and that uh, this momism uh, was an underlying cause, either the two uh, overly affectionate mother or the distant mother, whatever mothers did was wrong, uh, that that was a cause of homosexuality. Stephanie Kuntz, writing in A Strange Stirring, which I also have up here, uh, talks about how mom was the underlying cause of almost every social ill. She says, it produced sissies, murderers, and homosexuals. It even produced Nazism. And in that was the view of the time. Uh, think also about the fact that just a few years earlier, Senator Joe McCarthy from, unfortunately, my home state of Wisconsin, was notorious for his persecution of suspected communists and homosexuals. And if there was one thing that was worse in that time than being a commie, it was being a commie queer. Now, one might have hoped uh, that with her background in left and progressive politics and her focus on the situation of women, that Fridan would maybe take a little bit of a step forward into a more enlightened view. But that didn't happen for over a decade, and even then it was very reluctant. Now, from my own point of view, uh, as somebody who in college realized that she was gay, I, I basically bought into many of those ideas, spent my whole years in college in the closet, didn't know anyone else who was gay, even though there were clearly people around me who were, and moved to Chicago where I finally found the women's movement and the lesbian community. Uh, you know, I wish those proselytizing lesbians had come around a little bit earlier. <laughs> uh, and in one respect, I think I was quite lucky in coming to Chicago because I found a community and a movement where I could be open about being gay, but also work with other women to advance a broader vision of the world that included women's liberation and gay and lesbian liberation, that included the fight against racism uh, and against the war. Uh, while in the Women's Union, which was the primary organization that I worked with uh, in the 70s, uh, there were certainly differences, there were debates, but there was a commonality of spirit that acknowledged that even if we were working on different issues, whether it was job rights or child care or gay and lesbian rights, that we were working together for a common goal, that we shared a vision uh, that uh, we could fight for uh, as uh, an organization as well as as individuals. And from that, I think, uh, I drew uh, more hope. Uh, some people uh, have called me a Pollyanna because I'm eternally hopeful that things are going to move forward. Uh, but in, that, in fact, 
uh, we could go beyond what Ferdinand wrote about and actually achieve uh, a sort of broader uh, view of uh, women's liberation than she was able to enunciate in her work. Um, you know, it is really hard, I think, um, well, let me start out by saying, you know, I'm an activist, I'm not a scholar, and if I, you know, became a scholar, I would be curious to try and see, you know, trace more about the perceptions of the feminine mystique and the perceptions of the women's movement and how they became intertwined um, and fed in lots of ways divisions that then continued to reverberate throughout the movement and throughout our organization. So, it's really not, you know, as I say, my expertise. The kinds of things I was thinking about at that time really were more about organizational work and activism. Those were the things that really drew me. Um, but, you know, as I look at it now, it really is hard to reconcile the kinds of things that Trudan wrote and said with um, what we know about the left politics. Um, and in, in some respects, it makes it even more disappointing that it was fed divisions. Um, what she wrote. Um, and I would certainly say that the feminine mystique did feed those divisions um, based on race and class and sexual orientation that were very troublesome, um, very difficult in the women's movement. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure that those divisions would have been there anyway, but they were exacerbated or fueled, I think, by um, what she wrote. Um, and I think that, you know, the observations that I heard, I, unfortunately I wasn't here for the first um, round of conversation this morning, but, you know, from what I heard um, about this notion of Betty as celebrity, um, there is really a lot of truth to that. Betty was not an organizational person. Um, and so it's, it's in a way kind of ironic. She was much more of a catalyst, but not a builder. Um, so she could bring the right people in the room at that very first meeting of now, um, women who had tremendous organizational capability and, and experience. And those were more of the women who became my mentors, Catherine Conroy from the Communications Workers of America and others, uh, Dorothy Hayner, who really um, were interested in how you build organizations and build a movement. Um, Betty was a catalyst, so just to, to you know, she was, um, she was perfectly outrageous in her speech. She was often very outrageous in the way that she treated people. And she could be phenomenally supportive and positive about what you were doing to spread these ideas. So I also remember her as being, you know, one of the great troopers of all times when we had a fundraiser for Chicago Now. And it was in, ter you know, some place that we got for free. And I think it was like the upstairs of a racquetball court. I mean, it just could not, for those of you who remember racquetball, it could just not have been worse as a venue for a fundraiser, because you could hear this thwack, thwack, thwack through the whole thing. But anyway, it was free. So one of the ways we raised money, in addition to selling tickets to this thing, was we had someone standing there with a camera. And you had to, if you wanted your picture taken with Betty Friedan, you paid. Betty Friedan was blind as a bat anyway, but she was blinder by the time. I mean, you know, she, had, she was very nearsighted. I don't mean that to be, you know, she was very nearsighted. And then she had flash bulbs going off in her face for about an hour. And she was perfectly good humored about it. Um, so it was, you know, it was very confusing to deal with her. But I'll just give you one um, example. She called the 1970 strike for women's equality um, for August 26th. I think she called it, the now people in the room could maybe, what do you think, March of 1970 or so? The yeah, giving us about, giving people about, I wasn't there, but giving people about six months or less to organize a nationwide strike in which women were supposed to walk off their jobs and, you know, create this huge stir about an agenda for equality. Um, she did that without consulting people. I believe she consulted uh, Kay Clarenbach, who was the first chair of the board of Women Employed and a very strong organizational person. I think she, she consulted Kay and Kay told her, don't you dare. And she did it anyway. She got up in front of a huge room and all the media and she called this strike. So if you're an organizational person, you want to kill her um, because she's just set a task out in front of uh, the, the universe that you have to fulfill. Um, to, she was very, very lucky, I want to point out, that there were women who were good organizers all over the country who took up the, the challenge and, and did this. But on the other hand, so, so 
she started something really chaotic, and then you know the good organizers turned it into something. Um, it was immensely bold. Um, you know, there were what three daily newspapers or four daily newspapers in Chicago um, at that time, and it was the front page headline of every paper the day before, not after when it proved to be a success, but the day before. I, I remember, I think it was the Daily News or one of them. Uh, this, the headline was, Will Women Strike Today? It was the morning paper of the day of the strike. So it was a big, big, big deal. And um, it was immensely bold. I think it, it hugely launched organizations like Chicago Now, brought all kinds of members in. Um, and it really did scare the forces of the status quo. Um, it was brilliant. It was inspired. But it was completely anti-organizational. Um, and she didn't care that the board of now needed to discuss that. That was not of concern to Betty Friedan. So she, you know, we, we associate her with, you know, the formation of now and all that. And she was a powerful voice. She did draft the statement of purpose. She did bring everybody into the room. But she could not have built that or any other organization. It was um, all the other women in the room, the Catherine Conroy's, Dorothy Hainer's, Kay, Kay Clarenbach's, and others who put the organizational structures in place. And that was actually the dynamic that was um, much more interesting to me, even though I appreciated um, the fact that Friedan did support um, local organizing when she was a national celebrity. So there's one way in which Betty Friedan's ideas have been relevant to my activism and another way in which they have not. So first, the relevance. Once we had a critical mass of women lawyers at my law firm, I became very invested in seeing that they were successful. Uh, and I did that by uh, organizing regular women's lunches. We certainly had a celebratory lunch every time a woman was admitted to the partnership. But we had regular lunches in between, at which we talked about things like child care, um, how to develop business. Uh, I was very eager to see the women develop their own business, because that's the way you have power in a large law firm. And sometimes it's hard for women to uh, ask for business. So we had a lot of discussion about uh, how you go about uh, developing business. I pushed for a maternity leave policy. I was my first pregnant lawyer. Um, I had my first son in 1970. I worked until my, uh, 10 o'clock the night he was born, and then I went to the hospital, and I was back in my office in a week. Um, I had another child and uh, another son in 1974, and again I took another week off. No one had heard of maternity leave policy at that time, and there was no place that you could buy maternity clothes that were suitable to wear to an office. Uh, as an aside, I want to assure you that both of my sons have turned out very well, even though I only <laughs> took off one week with each birth. <laughs> I also pushed to have women as head of the various practice areas in the firm. And I'm very proud to report that my law firm now has a woman managing partner uh, for the first time. There are very few large law firms in the United States that have women managing partners. And then the second area where Betty Friedan's uh, ideas have not been relevant to my work is, of course, my major passion in life, which is providing uh, education and other opportunities to economically disadvantaged young women of color. Uh, the organization of the Young Women's Leadership Charter School uh, was a wonderful experience. We had a group of 23 women who came together and worked for tw uh, two years uh, before or organizing this school, the only uh, all-girls public school in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. This is our 14th academic year. Uh, we are serving 350 girls in <coughs> grades 7 through 12. I like to say we don't claim that single-sex education is for everyone, but it has always been an option for wealthy families, and we wanted to make it an option for uh, some economically disadvantaged girls. So uh, that work is very challenging and very rewarding. I'm particularly proud to say that 100% of our seniors graduated last year and 100% enrolled either in two or four year colleges.
So Betty Friedan was not focused on this group, but this is my passion. <laughs> Well, thank you for some really, really um, both fascinating and moving comments um, and um, kind of memories and insights on the moment that uh, the book came out. My question is about activism and politics. And um, one of the things, I mean, you were saying that Betty Friedan was not an organizer. She was a celebrity of some sort. Um, and somebody else was saying that the women's movement provided a shared vision, a common purpose. And yet all of the activism that you all are talking about is, is activism outside of the realm of formal politics, that is, i.e. party politics, or um, even on a local level. And so, and I know that all the different organizations push politicians in various ways. But if you look at other countries, for example, um, social movements come together in different ways under kind of an umbrella, under umbrellas that participate in the political process as much as they, act, they are active outside of the process. And so I just wonder if you might reflect a little bit about this issue in American life, which seems to me that there's a tremendous amount of activism that is rarely, it's translated in, in, in kind of um, indirect ways to, you know, let's just say elections or, or um, formal politics. And, is, and I don't even mean Democratic and Republican, I'm even thinking third party or something, but is there a way that the women's movement um, might speak to larger political coalitions? I think there definitely are. Uh, and I heard uh, Kristen Gillibrand, Senator Kristen Gillibrand from New York, uh, talk recently about how the uh, Democratic and Republican women senators get together on a regular basis so that they know each other socially. And uh, she told me that uh, bills that all the bills that she has passed have had support of Republican women senators. She also commented on the fact that women are much more about getting something done, getting the work done, collaborating, and, and it's not about ego. So, you know, we need more uh, women senators and representatives. I don't think, th does this work? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, great. I'd like to speak to both the history and, and my own personal experience. Uh, the history, and, and we didn't, you know, this was a short panel and there's a lot more we could all share. Uh, Joan, Ann, and I collectively uh, have had, uh, I'd say, um, an entire professional lifetime of experience uh, engaging with political figures and advocating uh, within the political system. So uh, there's lots we could tell you about that. Uh, we didn't get to that yet. Um, from my own personal point of view, um, uh, at the age of 26, along with some of the other things we were talking about, I was a consultant to the National Women's Political Caucus, raising money, um, took Carol Burnett to Springfield uh, um, to uh, advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, we all have long histories of absolutely engaging in any number of ways. Uh, both Anne, Joan, and I have all served on political bodies appointed by public officials of note in Illinois. Uh, I, so I think there's a long and rich history, which I'm glad uh, to report on or to share with you, of uh, women activists, uh, feminist activists in Chicago being intimately engaged uh, with the political power structure here for the last 40 years. Uh, in my book, which is all about this topic, uh, I interviewed um, 30 women from all over the country, uh, some of whom, about a third of whom are from Chicago, and uh, I talked with them about their political careers as feminists, as women committed to public service and public power in order to benefit women. Uh, like Senator Gillibrand. 
Uh, I interviewed Senator Stabenow, who is my age, uh, started out in 1976 on the county board in northern Michigan. So I think there is a very long and very rich history uh, of political engagement here and elsewhere. And I also think that um, it relates to something that came up this morning that I wanted to underscore, which is that for many of us, even those, who came, those of us who came from the far left, uh, we understood very quickly. Uh, it took me from the age of 23 to the age of 26, 40 years ago, to understand that unless we engaged in structural change uh, that benefited women in the political system, all the books in the world wouldn't make any difference. And so, for instance, I quit graduate school because that seemed to me to be a more compelling uh, activity to undertake. So I, I say that to you to say that I think that uh, while the U.S. Uh, may lag behind many other countries in the number of women uh, who hold elected office, there is a very rich history and contemporary movement uh, to see more women in public office and to seek it. Hi, um, I'm Erin McCarthy, and you've spoken about, um, all of you have given, or many of you have referenced how Chicago is different, and I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate on that, and maybe, Chris, if you could start, because talking about the issue of sexuality and your experience in Chicago, and maybe kind of the master narrative of that split, um, and the contribution of the feminine mystique to exacerbating divisions or, or adding to them. Thanks. Well, I'll give it a shot. Uh, one of the things that, uh, well, actually, let me back up. About two years ago, I read a book called Victory, the Triumphant Gay Revolution. And it was written by a woman who actually was in Chicago, went to school here. Uh, and to, I found it extremely problematic because to read it, you would think that the gay movement was made up of uh, gay male lawyers in New York City and that that's who got us to the place where we are. And I think there's this idea that I've read also and I've been reading some sort of more academic feminist things of late that uh, there was this huge split somewhere in the 70s where you had uh, you know, the radical lesbians going off and then you had now over here and never the twain would meet. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't think that was true in most places and it certainly wasn't true in Chicago. There, there were divisions. If you look at where things were at in Chicago in the 70s, there was a whole fairly separatist oriented community uh, there was the sort of more left socialist feminists represented by the women's union. There was a homophile uh, movement represented by the Chicago Gay Alliance that was more male oriented, but not exclusively male. Uh, and there was now, um, and there were certainly lesbians involved in now uh, back then. Um, and I, I do think that there was probably more dialogue here. And one of my thoughts about Chicago, and this may be my prejudice because I love Chicago, even though I no longer live here, uh, but I think there's a certain practicality to Chicago that you don't find in many other places. And that people, for example, in 75, there was this situation where uh, two women went down to the city clerk's office to try and get a marriage license. Now, it was very problematic in a variety of ways, one of which is that one of the women was already married to a man. <laughs> you know, so, you know, strategically, practically, made no sense. Uh, but it created a sort of brouhaha because both now, which was working for the ERA, and the uh, gay movement here, which was working for a local gay rights bill, thought that this was going to undermine both of those efforts. And 
uh, out of that formed the Gay and Lesbian Coalition of Metropolitan Chicago, which included uh, everybody from more radical feminists to now uh, to the uh, gay male organizations, gay religious organizations, as well as uh, owners of various gay bars uh, and so on in an effort to try and promote uh, dialogue. And I think that it actually worked, at least to some extent, that there was some dialogue here that you maybe didn't find in quite the same way in other places. No, I'd say I, I would just uh, quickly say that um, I think there was much more interchange um, than in a lot of places, and I think it was the practicality, um, partly because Chicago, and again, I'm not a historian, but Chicago has a long tradition of community organizing, labor organizing, uh, women in leadership roles in the labor movement here that that women didn't hold anywhere else. Addie Wyatt being a you know primary example um, of the meat cutters. So there was that, and you know it was it was much more fluid than people thought because it was so easy to put people in a box. The Women's Liberation Union they were over here. Now was the reformist group. It was you know people liked those labels when in fact you know the founder of Women Employed did her graduate um, student internship as a staff person for the Chicago Women's Liberation Union and then went off to start Women Employed, which was a distinctly non-ideological um, organization that was modeled on two things. One, community organizing. How do we take community organizing techniques and apply them to the downtown business district? Think of the downtown business district as a neighborhood. And you go and talk with women and they tell you what needs to change and then you bring people together to do that and the farm workers, who at that time were organizing under a rights and respect banner as a means of beginning to lay the groundwork for ultimately uh, the potential of forming a union. So those were the strains that were in this non-ideological thing women employed, which kind of popped up and people couldn't really pick, figure out where to put the labels. And I think the fact that people weren't so focused on labeling and were more interested in how we were going to get the work done, I mean, women and now helped to form Women Employed, the graphics collected from the Women's Liberation Union did Women Employed's first logo, I think, you know. So the, the, we, I think there is a particular character here that led to that. There may be, I'm not from Chicago, moved here not too long ago. Uh, in Philadelphia in 1975, there certainly wasn't any kind of unity of any kind. If you were at the 1975 Now convention, were yes, you there? Yes, unfortunately, I was. <laughs> Do you remember Betty for Dan? You know, I've, I've tried to blank up that. She was up there about screaming them. about the lavender menace, menace, and and yeah. it was the East it's Coast terrible. and the West Coast, and they were fighting like crazy. I mean, the whole thing was a, a fiasco. Really, they yep. couldn't vote. Yep. Uh, nobody was getting along with anybody at that particular time. And in fact, I was at the station we're now put in, we got into an ABC station in Philadelphia. So we get in and we're supposed to do documentaries. Well, we don't know what we're doing, but we're there. And so we're trying to, we film this. And I have that footage of her screaming from the floor and everything like this. She was, like you said, not a nice person. She was very abrupt, very rude and Nobody else's opinion mattered at all. And you're absolutely right. She couldn't organize anything. But uh, at that particular time, it was a very traumatic time for now and for all the women that were there because they, it was the black women and the lesbians and then uh, the main line will say <laughs> women and they were completely at odds. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a congenial uh, relationship no. at all then. It, it drove me right back to local organizing. That was the end of my career in National Now. Yeah, that was the end of it. I never, I went, never went beyond that. But I, but I just, I do want to say about that, that there were a whole lots of divisions and they weren't always the ones that people thought. You know, there were people who were really reacting to the, to the cultural aspects of feminism. And I think some of us in Chicago overreacted to that. And we wanted a much tougher economic focus. We really wanted the practical change focus. We were inexperienced and we blundered right in to 
the fact that many women came there because they really were isolated and they wanted a spirit of sisterhood and they saw what we were doing as destroying that. I mean, this was a movement that grew so fast and people came to it with so many different needs and so many different expectations. And frankly, there just wasn't the experience broadly enough in a group that grew like that to handle um, the tremendous pressures that that organization was under. Um, so I look back on it now and I can see, you know, that we made mistakes, others made mistakes, there were all kinds of divisions going on. The, the forces against the women's movement were gaining steam at that point. So there, were just, there was just an inability to handle all of that. Um, for a young organizer as I was at that time, though, it really was a good lesson for me. It, it reminded me that I need to be working with real people at a grassroots level and really trying to make change and that I, I didn't have the energy or the imagination for the national politics that that organization required at that time. Others did and I think they went on to do some healing, but it was pretty terrible. <laughs> just to go back to the how Chicago was different a matter for a minute, just a little bit of history. Uh, I think there were a couple, and it goes back also to this issue of our engagement with uh, political uh, infrastructure. Um, we, on the one hand, there was this community organizing uh, uh, background, the whole Alinsky thing about how to approach social change, and on the other hand, we had a mayor who ran this city with an iron fist, and a tremendously segregated city. And for those of us who, uh, there was some discussion earlier about 1963 being a very big year uh, and the March on Washington, Marianne pointed out earlier to me, for those of us who grew up uh, understanding about the civil rights movement and committed to uh, social justice for people of color, there, there was something very important in Chicago about figuring out how to, um, have the women's movement and the civil rights movement join forces. So I just want to tell you two things in our history that I think are different uh, from the women's movement in other cities. Uh, one is that by the mid-1970s, uh, when Operation Push started, the white women, including those at this table, who were working for ERA ratification, were working hand in hand with the African American women leaders of Operation Push and their constituents. The second thing I want to tell you is that by 1982, the fall of 1982, many of us were working for the election of the city's first African-American mayor, Harold Washington, who was pro-choice, who was a feminist, who had, was the sponsor of the authorization of the Voting Rights Act, and who was committed to doing things for women that uh, the other two candidates uh, uh, were not as explicit about. Uh, I and a couple of my friends wrote his women's agenda on the, my kitchen table. We took it to him. He had no problem with it. And he understood that if he was going to uh, win and be mayor, he needed to understand the feminist agenda and to act on it. And that he did win. Uh, maybe the other two candidates would have come to the same conclusion. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, that strong feminists, African-American, Latina, and white came together over 30 years ago in this city to create political policies and political empowerment for women and really have never uh, backed away. So while there may be other big cities that have a history like that, I think it does uh, evidence the practicality that both Anne and Chris uh, were pointing to. Hi, um, I'm actually gonna ask a personal question because I'm gonna be a little selfish today. Uh, I am an education professor, so I have the privilege of getting to have these kind of conversations with future teachers. And my scholarship is based in feminist theory. So I get to have these radical conversations to get fired up, come to conferences today, get more fired up. But then I go home to my seven-year-old little girl. And we have conversations very much about how things really have not changed too much you know, why is it that, um, you, know, uh, you know, the boys won't let her play kickball? You know, she asked daddy, um, I play soccer, so she asked daddy to teach her how to throw a football. So she sees these glass ceilings that still very much exist in American public schooling. So I'm wondering, 
as strong women who are doing this amazing work, uh, what advice do you give to mothers about how to teach their young girls to, be, to really interrupt? You know, this, we think things have changed, and they have. And I mean, no disrespect to the women who have blazed the path for me to even be standing here, but they haven't changed enough. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Joan's the mom in the group. Well, having uh, been 14 years at the girls' school, I've, I've developed three principles. Uh, and the first is, uh, it's very important to get the girls to believe in themselves. Uh, you need to, they need to develop confidence. They really need to believe in, in themselves. Uh, secondly, they need to understand the value of hard work and that uh, hard work trans can translate into success. And then in our school, we work, uh, the third point is we work to bring their academic achievement up to a level where they can uh, go to college and, uh, and do the work. So I would say for any daughter, uh, I would very much uh, want them to develop confidence in themselves. I would want them to be hard workers. Uh, and I would uh, hope that they would uh, become very well educated so that they can pursue any line of work that they want. I, even though I don't have kids, I, I just saw a quote not long ago on Facebook uh, from Gloria Steinem who said, the best way we can teach our daughters and other young women to be fearless is by example. And I think that's probably the most important thing is having that example of women who are doing stuff, whether it's, you know, in your own home or on TV or at school or anywhere else, that those examples make a real difference in people seeing that there are other choices for them. I'd like to shift the focus from daughter to grandmother. <laughs> I've been playing a little game in my mind. If I were the age I am today, 30 years ago, what would my life be like? Am I better off now? And because of the women's movement. Uh, I mean, you all were here for, on this planet 30 years ago. <laughs> and you're still here. And maybe you're going to be here for another 20 years or more. Um, this is not only uh, a black, white, lesbian, gay, heterosexual. It's women as they age. Uh, and I, you know, I feel like going back to Betty Friedan's book of the Fountain of Age. But um, I, I'd like to know what what presence age has. What presence age has here? Looking around, I would say we have collectively a lot of age here. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I'm one of the leaders of the pack. I'll tell you, uh, just a, as a reflection on age, I, I think um, one of the things that we've been working very hard on at Women Employed is to um, make sure that we have lots of opportunities for women who are in my age category uh, and maybe a little younger to interact with and share uh, work and strategy with young women who are coming along um, today. And I have to tell you, it is one of the most rewarding, uh, most exciting parts of my work right now because actually young women are very, very interested in these issues. They're very energized to make their mark on the world. They want to talk about how they can have influence. Um, they want to be actors and actually, if, you know, for my nieces, I had those conversations with them about, oh, really, that's happening? What do you think should happen? What should, do, what should happen differently? What do you think you can do about it? Because you know, we need women and girls to see themselves as actors, as, as, as having influence um, on these issues. And so to me, what I'm thinking about in terms of age is not only the basics about women employed, which is we better get women more pay. We better get them better ability to save for retirement. They're going to be living a long time. And really, the fact that so many older women are in poverty is a national disgrace. And so we need to do something about that. Um, but one of the ways that we can 
tackle some of those issues to make sure that this that younger women, the next generation, some of them are you know already scholars and they're here, um, are really um, both making their own mark and having the benefit of our support and encouragement. Um, and I can tell you that the the energy that young women infuse in women employed right now is one of its, I think, um, most important assets. Uh, so it's both a combination of our track record and experience that women my age have helped to build, and then um, uh, the energy and enthusiasm and actually tremendous savvy of young women. Because we didn't know anything about women's history. Women, I mean, that was all on our own, right? And now the women who come to Women Employed who are young, they're so sophisticated. They know all kinds of things about organizing political theory and feminist history and all that kind of stuff. They're just ready to go. So there's one other thing related to what Anne said I would just like to add from my experience working with younger women and helping them out and certainly in the experience of writing my book and interviewing a lot of them. Um, I think it's really, really important for us, those of us who have had these uh, many years of experience to help women understand not only the personal stories of uh, working hard and empowerment and change and trying to make the world a better place, but to understand the structural context in which we worked, the strategic uh, sensibility that we deployed, and, and then in that context that they can do the same. It's not about a single woman leaning in, in my view, uh, in terms of social change that benefits women. It is understanding what the power of the group can be and what are those issues that women, for instance, that women employed can work on together or women who are interested in politics can work on together. And if, if there's one thing I would just say, I hope that mothers share with their daughters I, uh, and women with their younger friends, it is this notion that you can look at the, system, the, the political system and you can say this is what we as women can do uh, to make it better if we work collectively and we're very savvy. And I think once they understand that, like us, they will uh, figure out what to do. Time for a couple more questions. Hi, um, I'm very interested in how women are portrayed um, in publishing, like in magazines and through the arts and specifically women of color versus white women. And I'm curious to know, um, have you, have any of you seen a trend in um, how a lot of magazines are just ignoring a huge population of women and strictly focusing on middle class white women or uh, women who are shaped a certain way specifically because of the money and, and how can activists or women who are concerned about these things uh, handle those kinds of issues? Um, so I want you all to know Bintu, who asked the question, who is actually one of my uh, lovely mentees and working very hard on the issue she just raised. Uh, I, uh, I think probably all of us would say that we just sort of feel a duty, Bintu, to um, when we see uh, sexist or racist behavior in whatever institutional context we have influence to, to say that's wrong. We want to change it, just as the stories uh, you know that you heard from Joan about what she did at her law firm. Uh, you know, she took the problem and said, "I'm going to solve this problem, and I'm going to create uh, uh, more opportunity for women and make women visible." So it's a sort of simple statement, but I, I do think that. Uh, it's the duty that we have to just sort of call it as we see it and then to find organizations that can systematically address these issues. And uh, there are some on the national level. Women's Media Center, I think, is the primary one that I'm aware of, where if, if uh, they have a project, I can't remember the name of it, um, Name It, Change It is the name of the project, right? So if you see sexist uh, language or portrayals, and you, you can just submit that online and they will publicize it and hopefully seriously embarrass uh, the people who <laughs> perpetrated that. Back here. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your stories. I'd like to express a lot of gratitude for everything that you've done for feminism. Um, my question is also sort of going back to the idea about age. There's a lot of 
hesitancy for women my age to call themselves feminists, and I was wondering if you could speak about where you think that hesitancy or even total, just absolutely like disavowing feminism comes from. Thank you. Well, let's just add that, from my point of view, to the long list of successes uh, that the right wing has had in uh, its labeling efforts. I mean, they are just darn good, aren't they? Um, so, you know, they, they did a great job of muddying up the term feminist. Um, as I say, I'm pretty thrilled that m more young women are ignoring that now and embracing it, and they understand um, that that's a product of the right wing's uh, reaction to the tremendous uh, success and power of the women's movement. So, um, to be honest with you, um, I'm not so interested in whether women embrace that label or not. Because it's really been true, would a woman who joined Women Employed in 1976, um, who was doing clerical work in the loop, think that she had joined the women's movement? Mm, no, she would not, because the women's movement already was a, you know, Big bad thing. So the real question for me is, you know, when we're having those conversations, what's the awareness component of it? How do we move from the labeling, the, the fact that, you know, there's a term um, that we either embrace or we don't, how do we move from there to the conversation about what it is we ought to be doing about the current situation for women? Because most of those individuals who are saying, I don't want to call myself a feminist, um, are not like, Phyllis Schlafly reborn, right? They're not for going back. They're not gonna deliver apple pie to legislators. They're not doing that stuff. Um, they are often smart, ambitious women who have simply, I, I, you know, and I, they just, I mean, the right wing's efforts to permeate, you know, to label and to permeate thinking, you know, have worked. And I think we just have to move off the dime and not spend too much time uh, on that particular aspect. I would rather that we spend the time helping people understand what the challenges are that remain. Um, I, I, you know, we may all have our quarrels with Sheryl Sandberg, but she's getting up there and she's making people think about these issues and talk about them. And to me, whatever I quarrel with Sheryl Sandberg about is minor compared to the, to the success she's had in getting people to talk about these issues. Um, and getting into places where these issues are not frequently talked about, like in gatherings of male CEOs and so on and so forth. So to me, it's all about that and not, not about the label so much. So I, I, I challenge you to figure out how to redirect that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, would you call that the <laughs> <laughs> um, Just a couple of things. I mean, I actually over the last year or two years, feel like I'm seeing some change in that. Oh, yeah. Partly through things like Facebook and the internet that, I mean, the internet has a lot of negatives in terms of portrayals of women, but there are also, I, like, there are Muslim feminists on Facebook, there's Indian <coughs> feminists on Facebook. I like all of these pages so that I can follow all of this. And so I think that, uh, I mean, I, as I say, people call me Pollyanna because I'm always hopeful, but I think that maybe things are turning. Now, one of the things that goes along with what Anne was saying is they don't turn by themselves. We make that happen. And so uh, part of what we have to do is to make sure that that turn continues uh, in the direction we want. One other, this is uh, aside from these questions, but I do have to say it's actually quite exciting to be in Illinois this week when the Illinois State Legislature actually passed the Marriage Equality Bill. <laughs> Forty years ago, if you had asked me when this was going to happen, I would say, what planet are you from? You know, <laughs> what world are you living in? So things do change. I think that's one example. And we make them change. We probably have time for one more question. Back here. Um, so a lot of the discussion today, I've been thinking about um, what it means to be a woman. I know as a feminist that's something that doesn't always get talked about because feminism is typically aligned with women. But what does that mean and how do we define it change over time and also determines who's included in the movement? So do you have any comments about how we can open up that conversation or 
broaden our community, much like was, what, which was talked about this morning of including men. I guess, how do you see that conversation happening in the field, or how does it come up in your work? Uh, at the risk of being uh, more blunt than I've already been, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've been married 41 years. I'm married to my high school boyfriend. I've been a feminist that entire time. Uh, I think that men have a duty to understand uh, women's equality, just as they have a duty to understand equality of people of different colors. So uh, I think period, end of sentence. And for those men who don't get the notion that men and women are equal, a pox on their houses. So, uh, you know, um, so I think it's important, yes, to uh, educate people about the importance of getting rid of racism and sexism, but it is not the duty of women who are trying to uh, create equality for women to spend a disproportionate amount of time helping men understand that this is important. We know it's important. We know we have been second-class citizens. We know we remain uh, being attacked for our most personal rights right now, speaking of state legislatures. So yes, men, understand that women have the same rights as, as you do, and uh, join in if you would. For me, um, economic issues, and I think the Chicago emphasis on economic issues. Chicago emphasis on economic issues and child care brought a broad consortium of women and men together, you know, that of different colors, minorities, classes, and so on. And to me, that was sort of the difference that Betty Friedan addressed, sort of a, you know, an educated class of women who maybe went to the Seven Sisters schools. I came from the working class. Uh, my father was an immigrant from Sweden. For me, being in the women's movement was a way to get economic equity. I think the issue is now that many people have mentioned this, women still do not have economic equity. You know, my daughter still is making 30 cents less an hour and um, had to fight to work from home. She had to quit her job to work from home two days a week due to, um, you know, childcare. And so all these issues, it was in NOW's platform way back in the 60s, childcare. You know, if you, if you want to understand how men thought back then, read Norman Mailer's The American Dream. Go back to, you know, all the, I was in college, I never read, I was an English major, I never read works by women, it, like everybody said. So I think young women, through educating themselves and maybe older women through being, um, you know, like everybody's being very generous, I get irritated. You know, I mean, I drag my daughter along as a feminist, so I don't have a lot of patience with young women who aren't. Is that? I'd like to say something too, and I'm not on the agenda here. There's an internal change that happened to all of us that were in the feminist movement. It was like a genes bubbling up or something because our whole perception of the world changed. Nothing was the same. We went from wearing hats and gloves and going to cocktail parties to wearing boots and mini skirts and marching down, you know. We, it changed everything in our lives. And so the big thing I would have to say to both of you is look at the world and look at yourself in the world because it's a question of being aligned with your own self and being an individual first and not accepting what you see around you as the way to be. 